John chapter 17. Uh, Beginning in verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes in heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you. That is the priority. The priority is the glory of God. And we are approaching the cross. And Jesus has entered in to a prayer just subsequent to his time with his disciples in the upper room. This prayer is a magnificent insight into inner Trinitarian communication. It's an amazing insight into Jesus' uh, earthly ministry, which he is currently engaged in, that is, interceding for us. And it is something that is to bring the disciples great joy, and it should bring us great joy. He starts off with the right priority, that is the glory of God, and then he moves immediately to the disciples. He is about ready to go through the pain and the agony, both physically and spiritually, of the cross. And yet his focus is on the Father, and his focus then is on the disciples, and we will see later on us, those who are his disciples yet to come. And what does, he, what does he pray for? He says um, in verse 6, I have manifested your name uh, to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and that they have believed that you sent me. And therefore, because these people are yours, because they have received your word, because they have accepted me and know that I have been sent forth from you, because they are the ones that you gave me, they are the ones that have been given before the foundations of the earth as a love gift between the Father and the Son, because of that, Father, I pray to you these things for them. And basically, it is this. In verse uh, 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I came to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name. Your name, all that you are, all of your character, all of your attributes, all of your power, all of your holiness, keep them. Keep them what? Keep them safe. Keep them safe spiritually. Keep their their faith intact. Take them from salvation to glory. Do not lose any, Father. I have kept them to now, but I have work to do on the cross. I need you to step in and protect them. It says, um, keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I I want you to, to do this, Father. I want you to protect them, and I want you to keep them unified in the faith, by your spirit, in their common love for us. Together, as they go out into the hostile world to be about the work that we have set before for them to do, Father. You need to watch over them and to care for them. While I was with them, verse 12, in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me, I kept them, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I come and I seek this, Father, that you may answer it, and that they, as a result, may have joy. Your joy, my joy, fulfilled in them, irrespective of the world, irrespective of the hostility that they will face. But it is the joy that comes from knowing you. It is the joy that comes from your spirit. It is the joy from understanding the reality that they are right with you for eternity. And they are safe in that. So, he says in verse 14, I have given them your word, 
and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that they should be taken out of the world. They're not to be taken out of the world, Father. We know that because that's why they have been saved. They have been taken out of the world in that they are no longer of the world. The world does not control them. The world does not dictate to them. They do not love the world. They do not participate in the world's philosophies and things. They are out of the world in that they are now part of your kingdom, Father. But their job is to go back into the world. That's why they have been saved. That is their purpose. The gospel and the furtherance of it is dependent upon these disciples carrying forth your truth. And for that, they will need your spirit. And they will need your protection. They will need my intercession. And I know that you will provide it. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then we get to this verse, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time. This is such a profound verse. It is uh, so filled with content and meaning in so few words. Jesus prays to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them. It means uh, two things biblically. It, it means uh, from, a, uh, from a positional standpoint that you have been called out, set apart to God. You are sanctified. But the way we use the term and the way the scripture uses the term most commonly is in a process. It is a process of sanctification. Sanctification just means to be set apart. Set apart. Set apart to God. Set apart to holiness. Set apart to his purposes. It is a process that is described in several ways biblically. Uh, one would be the process of spiritual maturity. It would be that process by which we grow in our understanding and in our likeness of Christ. That is spiritual maturity is that process by which God, after he births us new and we become new creations in Christ, then begins to move us into the people that we are. We are new in him. We are different. We have a different heart. We have different attitudes. We have different ways of thinking. But we must grow up into him. And that process is called sanctification or growing in Christ likeness. It is the process by which you live your life by faith without the ups and downs of the fleshly work in us. That is, we live our lives above our circumstances under the control of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. There are a number of ways to measure Christ's likeness. We could go to 1 John, which gives us a series of steps we go through from, from baby to young man to full adulthood. But the essence of it is someone who lives their life loving Christ no matter what happens to them in the world. They live, live a steadfast life that overcomes the issues of life and the world. It is, um, someone said once, you can measure your spiritual growth because we're all in this process. We're just at different places. And someone said you can measure your growth by this. What can steal your joy? I thought that's pretty good as a simple little test on how you're doing. You see, the, the, the spirit-filled person, the Christ-like person, will not lose their joy over anything. Nothing will cause their joy because their joy is supernatural. Their joy comes from the spirit. And that means their joy is manifested in and through the spirit's control in their life. And so when they see circumstances that are difficult, because all of us go through them, they do not look at them the same way they used to. They don't look at them as something bad, terrible, to be dreaded, to, to, to cause us to question the goodness of God. Rather, they look at circumstances as God's ordained events to change us, to build our patience, to draw us close to Him, to improve our prayer life, to have empathy for others, and on and on and on. They have God's perspective 
on the issues of life. Sanctification is a process that we are engaged in if we are Christians and we need to embrace because it is the key to Christian living. Everything that we are called to do as Christians are done better as we become more and more like Christ because he does it all perfectly, right? So whatever we are called to do, the more we look like Christ, the more glory will be given to God in them. We are uh, better witnesses if we're more like Christ. We have more wisdom in the issues of life if we're more like Christ. We can serve and minister our gifts to others best if we're more like Christ. We can pray more effectively and more deeply if we're more like Christ. We can commune more profoundly with our Lord if we're more like Christ. So that is our purpose. That is the essence of Christian living. And that's what this verse is all about. This verse, this one verse, tells us that Jesus is praying to the Father that he do this, that that he is engaged in this process for us. And it becomes that fascinating dichotomy of God working out his own will in our lives and our submission to it that brings about sanctification. What are the tools? What are the tools God uses? Well, he says it, right? Sanctify them by your truth. Truth is what sanctifies us. The Word of God is truth. It is the primary tool. It is the tool used by the Spirit of God who indwells us as he applies those truths to the issues of life that God will bring to us that put us in that place where we are called to submit to it, make our decisions based upon it, and in that process we become more and more like Christ. The more we submit our will to Jesus, the more we begin to look like Jesus. The more we intake truth, understand truth, and allow truth to change the way we think and speak and live, the more we look like Christ. Because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is the Word incarnate. And God says He uses the Word written to change us. So how are we doing? Well, you have to um, you have to kind of look at what you think about the Word of God and how important do you believe it is. Go with me to 2 Timothy 3.16 and let me show you how God says the Word works in this process in a little more detail. 2 Timothy 3.15 I know you all have it memorized, but I'll just read it for you. Anyway. 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God breathed. That is, it is God's out breath. It is, it is God speaking. All scripture. It is God's words to you. Somebody said it's God's love letter to you. It is... God's very breath. It is accurate, it is sufficient, and it is exceedingly relevant to living if you're a Christian. It's profitable. That just means it's sufficient. It's productive in your life. Productive out in this process of changing you. You have to want to be changed. I hope you do. I hope you're not satisfied with where you're at. I know I'm not. I get, I get often reminded just how far I have yet to go. The only thing that gives me comfort is I remember how far I've come <laughs> in how I used to be. But it is sufficient. It is productive. What? For teaching. That is for the content of divine instruction. God wants to instruct you and I in living, in serving, in worship how to minister, 
how to build up others, how to be a testimony, and how to live holy lives. And then it is good for reproof, for correction. That is, it, it's, there's a negative aspect to the Word of God. It, um, let's see, how, do you, what, how would you put it? It slaps you upside the head. <laughs> right? it, gives you, it gives you basic attitude adjustments. Have you, have you ever had one of those before? You know, it's uh, like old J. Vernon McGee said, God takes you out to the woodshed every once in a while. <laughs> now that's for us old folks. Younger people don't understand that. It is, uh, it is to convict, to rebuke. In what areas? In the mistakes you're making in your living and the mistakes you're making in your doctrines, in your understanding of truth. And we've talked about this so many times before. You cannot live a right life without knowing truth, without knowing what's right. That's why he says, sanctify them by your truth. If you allow lies to define you and lead you and guide you, you will lead a life that is in rebellion against God and you will find yourself in trouble in trouble. So it stops you from that. It rebukes you. It is the word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a thought, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It is only the word of God that can tell what's going on inside you. Have you noticed that? I mean, I don't care how many accountability groups you have, and I'm not against them, please don't say that. Don't. And, I'm not, and, I, and I know I need people to hold me accountable, and they do. But the one that holds me accountable is the one that can get inside my thought process and inside my heart, and that's the Word of God by the Spirit of God, and He does that. That's why you have to stay in the Word of God. You can lie to every accountability partner you have, and they won't know the difference. But you can't lie to the Lord, and you can't lie to Him if you're honestly in His Word. What else does it do? Well, it corrects you. It, it, the word kind of means to restore you. First, it rebukes you. If you're willing to hear the rebuke, if you're willing to respond to the rebuke, the next thing the Lord does is He lifts you up, puts you back on your feet. He says, okay, Lou, I wish you wouldn't spend so much time down there. Get up. You know, let's go. That's what repentance and confession is all about. And it corrects and it restores you. And then it trains you. And what does training mean? It means training. It just... It just moves you toward Christ-likeness, toward sanctification, toward a, toward, a, toward a holy life. It moves you in the areas that you just don't understand. It teaches and trains you up that you can be adequate, complete, capable. You know, Ephesians 2, 8, and, uh, 2, 8 uh, through 10. Do you want to go there with me for a minute? It's, uh, you know, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And I don't, I, let's read it, though. It's, better. I like those rustling pages. This is a seminal verse in uh, in the New Testament, right? Uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace, unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor toward you is what's brought you into the kingdom. It comes by faith. That faith, the faith in Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done on the cross. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Even your faith is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It isn't any of your goodness. It isn't any of your religiosity. It isn't any of your ceremonies. It isn't any of that stuff. It is simply the grace of God that comes to you by faith. And then it says, For we are as workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. If you know the Lord then you were saved unto good works. You don't do good works to get saved, but if you're saved, you have a new heart, a new desire, and that desire is for Christ, and he calls you to live out a life that honors and glorifies him. And that's what the word of God does, right? It, it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training that you may be adequate, fully complete for all good works. In other words, it's how you live out your purpose. It is in and through and by the Word of God. You cannot be engaged in the sanctification process 
apart from the word of God. You cannot honor and glorify God apart from the word of God. And you cannot experience the blessing and the joy that God has for you in the Christian life apart from the word of God. It is truth. I want to say something. I I want you to listen very carefully because I don't want you to misquote me. Sometimes, sometimes we create things within church environments, not just here, everywhere, within the Christian church, intended to help people in the sanctification process, in growing in their love for Christ and, and, uh, and growing in their understanding of him. And many of those things are good. They have legitimate purposes. But there are times, I think, when we lead people to believe that they are an end in themselves. That if we go through this particular program, if we take this particular class, if we go to this particular seminar, if we fill out the answers to this particular little book, if we join this particular group or this kind of group, we will be sanctified. Well, you will be sanctified when you immerse yourself in truth. And the word of God is truth. And once you immerse yourself in it, you will be sanctified when you submit yourself to it. Make your decisions based upon what that says, not based on what you think is right or what you desire. You will be sanctified when you allow the Word of God to deal with your sin and to build you up toward a holiness. You must, you must desire the Word of God. You must listen to it, study it, meditate on it, read it, and then you must trust it and submit to it. And that will help you see the issues of life the way God sees them and help you respond the way that God desires you to respond. And the more that you do that, the more you'll find yourself like Christ. And through that whole process, you need to talk to him. You need to be in communion with him by prayer. The sanctification process can be encouraged by different methods. But the resources that God has given his church from the beginning are adequate. They've always been adequate. And they're always the same. It's the Spirit of God using the Word of God in the issues of life to change your life and to bring Him glory and to bring you blessing. So, if you are involved in things to help you in the process, praise God. But the process does not end at the completion of any kind of a method. The process is one we are engaged in and blessed by from the moment we come into a right relationship with God by our faith in Jesus Christ until we go home to glory. And we should say praise God for that. I'm not in any hurry. If you come to this class or any other classes where I'm privileged to teach or my wife Barbara teaches, you know that we are not teaching a speed reading course. We will get through the text when we get through it. And then we'll be really sad when we're done. Because it's the process. It's the process of growing in our love for Christ by listening to him speak to us in his word and yielding ourselves up to him. That's what our prayers are all about. It's not your will. It's not my will, Lord. It's your will. Let your will be done. And I can only let your will be done if I understand your will. And I can only understand your will if I take in your truth. And then only can I 
live it out if I submit to that truth under the control of the Spirit of God. That's sanctification. That's that one little verse, and we didn't touch it. So I'll commit the rest of it to your study because I know you're hungry. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. What a gift it is. What a joy it is to understand it. I, I, you know... We were just, Barbara and I were just talking the other day about how precious it is to know truth, to actually know why things happen and don't happen, where things are going and how we fit in, what our purpose is, where we came from. It's just the, the, the most brilliant of minds have no clue, Lord, and yet you've allowed us, by your grace, by your mercy, because of your spirit and in your truth, to know truth. Help us to revel in it, to rejoice in it, to count it a precious thing, to take it in and to live by it, Lord. That's our desire for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.